So amen. Right there we are. Let's just close our eyes. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your spirit and for your presence and for your power that's already moving through this church this morning. We give you all the praise, the glory, the honor, and the thanksgiving. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your presence in this church, Lord. And we thank you that, Lord, everything is in you, by you, through you, for you. We've come to worship you, to praise you, and to honor you. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and kindness towards us. Where would we be if it was not for you? We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we thank you for people that you've gifted to play musician, musicians that you've gifted to play instruments and singers to sing, Lord. We thank you for them. It was always your design and your purpose to bless people with that gift and that ministry. And Lord, this congregation thanks you for them and thanks you for the ministry that you've given them, Lord, and that you've blessed them and blessed us by giving them to us, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to the book of Psalms, chapter 124. That entire chapter. Don't worry, it's not four pages. It's only eight verses. Amen. Psalms 124, eight verses. And I'd like to read it to you before I put it on the screen. It says the following. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, when the waters would have overwhelmed us, the streams would have gone over our souls, then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our souls have escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. I'd just like to read that first five verses again as you can see it there. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swollen us alive. Then their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters would have overwhelmed us. Then the streams would have gone over our souls. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our souls. Amen. If it had not been, look at that first verse there. Do you see it there? If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. Look at verse 2. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. Amen. How many of us can say that this morning? If it had not been for the Lord, where would I find myself this morning? Amen. You know, sometimes if I drive past a beggar or if I drive past a person that's on the street, and sometimes if I drive past some of them that were not so lacquer, you can see when somebody's not lacquer. You can see when there's something that's wrong, they have a mental problem. Uh, you know, oftentimes when I drive past and I think to myself, if I don't have something to give or to help, I think to myself, Yea, but for the grace of God, there go I. If it wasn't for His great love, if it wasn't for the Lord, I'm telling you now, I would have been on the street, in a mental institute, in jail, or I would have been dead by now already. If it had not been for the Lord. Amen? If it hadn't been for the God that we love and serve. And there's a song that I love with all my heart. I'm not the greatest singer, but I'm going to sing it anyway this morning. And, I, and, and, and the song says, Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man named Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man named Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man named Jesus, then forever 
my soul would be lost. There's another song that says, Oh, how, oh to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. High English, but I'll put it in, in, in plain English. Oh, to grace, how much I owe. And daily I'm forced to remember it. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Had it not been for Jesus, had it not been for grace, had it not been for mercy, had it not been for one night when I sought to turn my life around because I knew I wasn't going to make it and I ran to Jesus, had it not been for one night where Jesus came and met me at an altar call, had it not been for that moment when, when Jesus showed up on the scene, on the disaster of my life, on the disaster that I've made of it. So I wanted to do things my way. I wanted to run and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that and I wanted to live my, way, my life that way. And every single time, I think we can all agree, every single one of those roads, destruction, disaster, disappointment, failure after failure, and worse, on top of it, I was living in sin. Amen? What does the Bible say about sin? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through who? Through Christ Jesus. Amen? If I'm going to live life my way, I... I Trust me, we live in sin. If we live life God's way, we live according to God's law, then we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer a sinful person. I've been set free from that. I don't walk according to that way anymore. Amen? When Jesus comes into a situation, when Jesus comes into a life, when Jesus comes into circumstances, when Jesus comes in, Jesus makes the difference. Amen? There's always a change that happens when Jesus shows up. There's something beautiful I see in the Old Testament and I just want to share it with you as well this morning. There's something that we see in the book of Numbers and it's amazing to me because of the way it speaks of Jesus. Maybe you know this this morning, maybe you don't know it this morning, but it's beautiful to me and I want to give it to you this morning. In Numbers chapter 21 verse 8 it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. You see, the wages of sin is death. The children of Israel were following Moses. They were obeying God because God appointed Moses as a leader over them. Amen? Moses wasn't doing his own thing. He was doing what God told him to do. He was telling the people to do what God told him to do. It wasn't his own little story. He was following God. And it was God's plan to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, to to teach them His laws, to reveal Himself to them, and to make unto Himself a people for Himself, to fulfill the promise that He had in Abraham. Right? Right? And when the children of Israel just come out of a battle, they get tired along the way. They get weary. And they start to grumble and they start to moan against Moses and against God. Listen, God is feeding them with angel food in the morning. They're getting manna by morning. It's angel food. It's not normal earthly food. It's angel food. God's feeding them with angel food in the morning and God's giving them quail by night. God's looking after them. And along the way they start to grumble. You know what they actually grumbled about? They moaned and complained about the bread that God was giving them in the morning. Do you know that? Read your Bible. They were upset. They were saying, it doesn't fill us enough. It's too light. They were looking for the thick bread that they got back in Egypt. So God has taken them out of slavery. God has brought them to a place where He's feeding them, looking after them. He's given them His law. He's leading them from victory to victory. He's taken them to a promised land. And they're grumbling about what they're eating. They're unhappy with what God is giving them. And they think that they can get better things from the world. So in other words, their heart is wanting to turn back to the things they had before. This angel food is too light for us. And they're moaning and they're complaining against God and against Moses. And you know what God does? Because the wages of sin is death. If you're not going to follow God, then you walk in the ways of death. God sends serpents among them to bite them and torment them. In other words, when anybody was bit by these serpents, they died. And Moses intercedes for the people like a type of Jesus. Because they run to him and say, please intercede for us. Please go speak to God on our behalf. These, these, these serpents are killing us. These fiery serpents. It bites, it burns, and the people are dying. Because the wages of sin is death. Amen? And God says to Moses, you take a serpent, make it out of brass, put it on a pole and lift it up. And whoever's been bitten, if they look at the serpent, they shall not die. If they look at the serpent, they'll live. Amen? That was a big amount of Jewish people that came out of Egypt. Some of them could only see a little speck in the distance. They could only see this little speck of a serpent in the distance. They couldn't even see it clearly. But as long as they looked in that direction of where it was, they were healed. Amen? It's amazing if you think about it. That God makes a way. But you know what's more beautiful is the next verse. 
John 3 verses 14 to 16. We know John 3 verse 16. But look at 14 and 15 that comes before that. Listen to what it says. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, Jesus, be lifted up. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoever looks to Jesus doesn't have to die because of the wages of sin, but he can have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes and looks to him should not perish but have everlasting life amen isn't it beautiful all the way back in the book of exodus and and this happened in exodus but in the book of numbers we see it written moses lifted up that serpent and when you see that serpent lifted up you know what it's saying all the way back there it's saying jesus will be lifted up it's a type of jesus being lifted isn't it beautiful amen and everything changes we are stuck in sin and death until jesus comes on the scene Amen. Nobody was justified under the old law. Amen. The Bible tells us about it. There was a place called Sheol. And in Sheol, this great expanse, were two things. One was hell and one was Abraham's bosom. And between the two was a divide separating those two. Amen. Anybody who died under the law, correct under the law, did not go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom. Amen. Those who died without the law went to hell. Those that died in the law went to Abraham's bosom. In Abraham's bosom, it was a place of waiting. It was a place of comfort. But they were not justified in the sight of God. They were not justified to go to heaven. That's why people get it completely wrong. When the Bible says Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. When the Bible says, oh, open up the ancient doors, the ancient gates for the king of glory enters in. Who is this king? The Lord Almighty. It doesn't mean he entered into hell. It means he entered into Sheol, into Abraham's bosom. And there in Abraham's bosom, he preached the gospel to them so that they could be justified. Then he took them out of, Abraham's bosom is no, no, no longer in Sheol. He took them out of there, took them to heaven because he revealed to them the gospel of himself because they always called upon the name of the Lord the name of the Lord they never knew the name of the Lord was Jesus then he revealed to them I am him that you've been waiting to come and he took them she whole now exists only with hell on the inside and she has enlarged her borders because of the people that have gone there it's become bigger and bigger amen nobody was justified under the old law but when Jesus comes everything changes it changes when Jesus appears on the scene can you imagine what it must have been like in Abraham's bosom when the Lord of glory shining in all of his power walked into that place and those ancient doors that were locked just opened and he walked in and he declared himself to them and took them into heaven. Can you imagine how fantastic that must have been? It must have been amazing. Amen. Who can have a testimony how amazing it was when Jesus walked into your life with the light of his love and of his glory? I lived in darkness. I lived in depression, in darkness, in addiction. I lived in the claws and in the, in, in the cloa, in the jaws of death. I thank God. That's why to grace how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Because you know what I often think of? What happens if I accidentally overdosed in those days when I knew not Christ? What happens if I died? What happens if one of those times I ran away from the police when they were chasing us in the car? What happens if we wrapped ourselves around the pole? What happens if I just took too much drugs the one night? What happened? You know what would have happened? I would have stepped into eternity separated from Jesus forever. I would have gone into hell fire. I'm saying about myself now. I'm not talking about anybody else. I know that if I died in those days, I would have gone to hell. Because I knew him not. I served him not. I did not pray. I wasn't interested in him. But there came a day when he appeared on the scene. <laughs> and everything changed for me. Because Jesus, when he appears, he changes every situation, every circumstance, everything in my life. We get so impatient like the children of Israel, grumbling and moaning about, uh, about the heaven and angel food that they're eating. It's too light for them. They want more for their stomachs. You know, children, we, we people, we can be like that as well. You come to God and you begin to serve God and you begin to come to church and you think everything's going to change immediately. We want it to change quickly. God doesn't work that way. God can change you and He can have you be born again from above instantly, like that. One night, one moment, if you'll get honest with God and say, Lord, I give you my life, I give you my all, my every breath, my every moment, I surrender it all to you, like the song we sang. If you'll get honest with God like that and surrender it, in an instant you can be born again from above. But you know why some children of God get disappointed and discouraged? Because they're made oftentimes to wait. 
And as a Christian, you must understand there's two beautiful sisters that always hold hands. One's name is faith and the other's name is patience. Those two sisters, they don't go anywhere without each other. They're always holding hands, faith and patience. We can have faith, but sometimes we don't have patience. People come into the church and they begin to serve God and they expect that, okay, now I'm going to get the job. I'm going to get the promotion. Things are going to go better for me this way. And, and people expect it too soon. Forget about those things. Seek ye first God and, the king, and His righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all those things shall be added unto you. It breaks my heart when people come into the church. They don't see the results as fast as they want to. And they leave the church and they go back to the world again. Amen. Stay here. Serve God. And I guarantee you, ask anybody in this church. Give it a few months. Give it a year. Watch how God changes you. I drove a Skoda Skoda. Now I drive a new car. I had no wife. I had girlfriends. Now I have a lovely woman of God. I had no honesty, no goodness in me. Now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. He took me and He changed me and He made me a new creation in Christ Jesus. And it didn't happen overnight. It took a space of a few years for God to deal with certain things in my life. But if you come to Jesus and keep coming to Him, one thing you can be guaranteed is that when Jesus comes on the scene, when Jesus gets hold of the life, when you accept Him, because He says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock, if any man will open, I shall come in with Him. And I shall come in with my father and we shall have a meal, intimacy together. If you stay with him and keep serving him, he will change you. He'll change your attitudes, he'll change your thoughts, he'll change your behaviors. And yes, he'll change your circumstances. I never got a bonus at work. I was always on the edge of being fired. Sometimes I did get fired. But at APSA, I was always on the edge of getting fired. I I was always in trouble. I was always late. I was always everything. When I began to serve God, you know what happened? I wasn't late for work anymore because God put something different on the inside of me. I began to read my Bible at my desk. So in other words, I openly said to everybody, I'm a child of God. With everything else that means you're going to expect from me, then it's done now. There I am. My Bible's in front of me. I read my Bible so people knew. And when people know, they expect something different of you, don't they? They don't treat you like the other oaks that smoke with them. If you fluke, then they they cross with you. I thought you were a Christian. If you lay through for work, then they cross with you. I thought you were a Christian. So I began to read my Bible so that they could see, so that I could put drink on myself, so that I could be at work on time. You know what happened? Two, three years after I came to God and I started to serve God properly, and God was dealing with things in my life over that time, I said to the Lord, Lord, you said I'm blessed. You said I'm the head and not the tail. Lord, I've never received a bonus. Lord, I would like a bonus. Ask my wife. When bonus time comes around, I get a bonus. You know why? You know why? Because Jesus changes everything. And you know what? The biggest thing that Jesus changed was not the circumstances and the situations. He changed me. He changed me. So that when my boss thinks it's bonus time, my boss says, yeah, he's always at work on time. Yeah, he, he always does the work. When I have something extra, he never complains. He does it. You know why? Because Jesus changed me first. If you let God change you first, then God changes the rest of the stuff around you. Amen? When he shows up on the scene, things change. Amen? William, did God not change you? Radically. (laughs) Hein, did God not change you? Completely. Wim, God changed you. Completely. Amen. God changes us completely. Amen. Psalms 124. Look at what it says. In the beginning, if it had not been for the Lord, men would have chewed us up. If it had not been for the Lord, the devil would have chewed me up and spat me out. When I see people on the side of the road, I'm, I'm, I feel sorry for them and hard sore for them. Because I know that Jesus wants to give them life. And I know that when I look at them, you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing somebody the devil got hold of. The devil got hold of him. And the, or her. And the devil chewed them up and spat them out on the side of the road. That's what you see. Don't be too hard hearted when you see people like that on the side of the road. The devil got hold of them. The devil chewed them up and spat them out. The devil separated them from their family, separated them from work, separated them sometimes from husbands and wives and children and spat them out on the side of the road. The devil got it right to use them to break all those relationships, to ruin everything that God had for them and ruin their bodies and get them addicted and then he spits them out. He doesn't care. And it breaks my heart because Jesus wants to give life and life more abundantly. Jesus just wants to come in and change the situation and change the circumstances. You know what breaks my heart? In the Bible we see two things. One, Jesus went to his own city and his own town. Jesus went to Nazareth. And when he walked in, he himself marveled that he could do no great works there. Because they did not believe. You know what the Bible says? They did not accept him. They didn't accept him. This is Jesus. And we know his brother. And we know his mother. And we know his father. And Jesus said, the Bible says he could only do one or two miracles there. Because they didn't accept him. 
just after that, the Bible says he goes into the coasts of Gennesaret, I think it is. And when he walks into those coasts, the people from those coasts go find the sick. So in other words, they don't just bring the people. They find the sick in all the coasts. And they bring them to Jesus. And they say to Jesus, if these can just touch the hem of your garment, we know they shall be healed. You know what the Bible says? And he healed them all. In other words, he walked into their situation and changed it dramatically. Drastically forever. He changed it. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Blessed be God who hasn't given us over to the enemy to chew us up and spit us out. Amen. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. You know what that means? It's a painting. It's a beautiful artistic poetry that's been painted. The devil is like someone that makes a trap. And he puts the trap ready. And he puts the... The bait inside the trap. And he's waiting for you and your life and your soul the way that a man waits for a little bird. And when that innocent little bird comes in to take what's being offered, he pulls the trap and he takes it away captive. No zaifulki gefangene. He's captive. Belongs to the one that caught him. And God says that's the plan of the devil for us, to catch us. And he puts bait there. Just think about what he's offering you and think about what he's exchanging when he, when he tempts you. But God says the snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is our help. Everything was made in Him, by Him, through Him and for Him. The Father made it through Jesus for us. Amen. Our hope is in Him. We don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in horses. We don't trust in men. We trust in the name of our Lord. Is it not? Jesus changes everything. Amen. But it's a strange thing for me. Jesus will never force Himself upon you. If there's things in your life you think you can deal with without having to go to God for it, God's not going to meddle in it. But if you will bring it to God and say, Lord, this thing, I'm giving it to you, please help me with it. Then what happens? When you go to Him and He comes to you, He changes everything. Amen? But a lot of the times we think we can handle certain circumstances. Okay, the things that are hectic, Lord, the serious things, now go to you with those in prayer. But we don't actually even think about it like I'm saying it now. It just happens subconsciously. That the big things, when we see, Yo, I'm not going to handle this, then we give it to God. But the smaller things, no, we'll sickle through those small things, eh? We'll battle through that. Okay, this, how am I going to do this this month and this and that? And we'll battle through it ourselves. It must... Uh, in my imagination, I imagine God's on the sidelines thinking, but if I'm helping you in the big stuff, why aren't you asking me to help you in the small things? I've helped you with that big stuff before in your past. I've loosed you, delivered you, set you free, broken those bondages. Why is it that you're sickling with the small stuff? Let me just do it for you. Because Jesus changes everything when He appears and when He comes in. Don't try and do everything on your own. Trust God. Trust Him to do it for you. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The woman with the issue of blood. I'm going to put you all on the spot again. How many years did she suffer with that issue of blood? How many? Twelve. Twelve. Quickly, quickly. Twelve years? Yes. Twelve years. She, su- she sickled with that. She was a Jewish woman. Which means she must have gone to the temple. But she couldn't go to the temple because the issue of blood prohibited her from going in. Because according to the Jewish law, she was unclean. Amen. Amen. So a woman couldn't come in. So where, she, where, 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 where could she go to? She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't go to the priests. Because if she touched the priest, the priest would become unclean. So for 12 years she ran around. She must have prayed. Don't tell me that woman didn't pray for 12 years. She must have prayed. She ran from doctor to doctor and her condition only got worse. The Bible said. Amen. Sometimes I don't understand why sometimes the Lord makes us wait. I don't understand sometimes... Why certain people go through difficulties for a long period of time. Because I know God's faithful. And I know the Lord can heal. And I know God's love towards us. So I don't have an answer for you this morning why she had to wait 12 years. But it is clear for me that when she heard Jesus was coming past, she made the same statement that the people in Gennesaret made. Strange, eh? She said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, I know that I shall be made well. And if we can just get hold of Jesus... Sometimes that means pushing through like she did. All the things in your life that distract. It means pushing through and not worrying if if this doesn't work or that doesn't work. It means going down on your knees. Because when she got to a place where she couldn't get through the crowd, I'm guaranteeing you she went down on her face and on her hands and on her knees. Because she knew one thing, if I can touch him, my situation and circumstances will change. 
Because Jesus changes everything. I don't know how long you've been waiting with something. I don't know how long you've been sickling with something. But I want to guarantee you, just push through. Just keep holding on to the hem of His garment. Just keep asking Him. Just get in contact with Him. As you not in contact can come, Jesus changes everything. Amen? He changes every situation. The man at the well, the pool of Bethesda, who knows how long he was stand, stand, uh, sitting there? Does anybody know quickly? How many years? Was it? Was it 30? 38. Was it 38 years? Another example, 38 years. <laughs> 38 years he's waiting. Once a year the angel comes down and stirs the water and every time somebody else gets in in front of him. You know, sometimes you've got to wonder to yourself, why are the people getting healed and I'm not getting healed? Why is it going better with other people and it's not going good with me? Come on, we ask ourselves these questions. But it's beautiful to me. 38 years he's sitting there and then on a day, Jesus walks past. On a day, Jesus comes to him and finds him. Look, the woman with the issue of blood, she pushed through and she went to find Jesus. This man, Jesus came to find him. It's beautiful, isn't it? Jesus asked him, what's your condition? He explains, somebody gets in before me. He says, come here. And Jesus changes his life in one moment. In one situation. Amen? Changes that situation in one moment. Amen? Makes him well. Makes him whole. He's lame. And he can walk again. She was bleeding. And he healed her. Amen? Because Jesus changes everything. I'm just using the examples this morning. Look at another example. And I love this picture. It's amazing to me. That's blind Bartimaeus. How long was blind Bartimaeus blind? From his birth. From his birth. Amen. I want to say something this morning. Some of us are born into different situations and different circumstances. We don't all come out of the same type of household. Some of us come out of broken households. Some of us come out of households where we had a mother and father growing up and we were in the church growing up and we had those things. Some of us come out of different situations. Some of us are born as blind Bartimaeus was born into a very difficult situation. Amen. We should never paint each other with the same brush. I know this much about what's really going on in your life and your past. And, but Jesus knows everything. Amen. And even if you're born into a situation, even if you were born into difficulties, even if you were born into a place, and some people are born into places where parents beat them, where parents are Satanists, and, and even at that moment, if you're born like that, just one touch from the Master's hand can change your life forever. He was born blind, but when Jesus said, See, he saw. You know what's amazing to me? Blind Bartimaeus didn't have to go to rehab to learn how to see and to get depth perception and to understand how to walk and to reach and to grab. When Jesus said, see, the eyes came back, the depth perception came back, and it was as if blind Bartimaeus had always seen his entire life. He could stand up and walk and it was no problem. He didn't have to have a rehab. Amen? I just want to say it this way. When Jesus comes into a life, I don't know who I'm speaking to, who I'm not speaking to. When Jesus comes into a life, I don't know what your past was like. I don't know how you were treated. I don't know how things went for you. But if you will come to Him and He can put His hands on you, then I guarantee you God can take a life. It doesn't seem like it could ever get better. And God can change it in an instant like that. Because when Jesus shows up on the scene, things change. They can't remain the same. In one night, in one night in a church, I went down A drug addict, when I stood up, I was loosed. I don't know how to explain it to you. Addiction, sometimes when the devil uses it, it gets put on the inside. It's got a hold on you on the inside. It's not external, it's internal. And that internal force drives you to go buy the drugs. On one night, God took an internal thing and pulled it out. Boom. And what the devil drove me from the inside, he could never get back in again. It now was an external addiction. It was a habit, but it wasn't an internal driving force. In one moment, the master of all creation put his hand upon me. Nobody saw it in that church, but when he put his hand on me, I went backwards and that was that. And what was inside was taken outside. Amen? And then it was a habit that came, don't you want to? And I just said, no. And it was easy for me to resist because it was no longer inside. It was taken out. Amen? I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know how you've been treated. But in an instant, if you'll surrender to the King of Glory, to the Lord of Righteousness, He'll put His hands on you. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was living amongst the pigs, but I've come back to my Father's house. He's put a ring of the Holy Spirit upon my finger. He's put robes of pure white washed in His blood upon me. He's given me the feet shod with the preparation of the Gospel. Me who was worthless, 
I was not much and he's made me something for his kingdom. He's taken those things that were not to confound the things that are. He's taken the foolish things of this world, which is me, to confound the wisdom of this world. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. God took this rubbish and turned it into something for his kingdom and for his glory. There is nothing in your life. There's no circumstance. There's no trauma. There's no nothing in your past that God cannot heal and cannot change. There's no sickness. There's no something you've been walking with for many, many years that he cannot change. There's nothing in your life that he cannot change. I'll say it again because he's come to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus comes to give life and life more abundantly. You know what's amazing to me about this picture? Those four friends who said, we know if we can just get him to Jesus. And when they faced obstacles and situations, can you imagine them climbing a roof and dragging their friend up with? Can you imagine them breaking open somebody else's roof? You know why they were doing it? Because they must have known, if I can just get him to Jesus, Jesus will change him. There's nothing better you can have in this life than friends that say, come, come, but we're going to church. doesn't matter what you're wearing, we're going to church. There's nothing better in this life if you can get hold of people that know what it is to serve Jesus. And know what a difference he made in their life. That love you enough to say, I know what he did for me. And if he did it for me, God's no respecter of persons. If he did it for me, he can do it for another. That they can get hold of somebody and say, my brood, you've got to get to church. Because they know something that hasn't been revealed to the other person yet. They know when Jesus comes in, a life changes forever. And for the better. And for eternity. Amen? There's nothing better than that. Get hold of people that say to you, where were you at the prayer meeting? Get hold of people that say to you, brother, you've got to get into church. It's not for me, it's for you. You've got to get hold of people that want you to get to Jesus. Because they know what he did for them. Amen? Amen? When that man was lowered at Jesus' feet, his life changed forever. You know, we so often focus on that one that was laid down at Jesus' feet. Can you imagine if you were one of the friends? When Jesus said to that man, take up your bed and walk. And that man stood up with his bed. If I was one of the four that lowered him, I'd have been on that roof going, Woo! Thank you, Lord! He's alive. He's standing up. He's going. He's healed. Amen. Can you imagine his four friends? His four friends must have been happy. Amen. Lord, let me not come into heaven one day empty-handed. I never want to come into heaven and say, I knew that thou was the hard task master. I know, Lord, that you reaped where you did not sow and that you, that you took where you did not plant. But I want to come into heaven one day and say, Lord, I took that which thou gavest me. It was one. One talent, Lord, and here I've added to that talent another two. Let me not appear before my master empty-handed. But let me say, Lord, I preached your gospel. Lord, I told them about you. Lord, I've dragged that friend to you, Lord, and I laid him at your feet. And Lord, you saved him because Paul plants and Apollos waters, but God gives the increase. But one day I'll receive a crown for doing what God wanted me to do. One day I'll receive a crown for being faithful. Amen? And why am I being faithful? Because I know Jesus changed me. And if He changed me, He can change you. Listen carefully. I know there was a time I was not filled with the Holy Spirit and did not understand how the Holy Spirit works in a life. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect when people talk about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I had no clue what that means. I didn't know what to expect when people say, you received the gift of talking in tongues. I didn't know what that was. I had no cooking clue. But when I met Jesus and I asked Him for it and He gave it to me, now I know what it is. Amen? And the Holy Spirit is so precious to me that all I want is for you to be filled with His presence. The Holy Spirit will never make you do something you don't want to do. He'll never make you act funny. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, man, you'll want to dance. When tongues comes and God gives you the gift of tongues for the first time, it will bubble out of the inside of you. You won't be able to stop it. It flows. One of the most precious gifts I've received in my life is the gift of speaking in tongues. Because when I don't know what to pray, it proceeds out of me. Then I can just say, Lord, And out of my heart, the Holy Spirit speaks to God and God speaks to me. And my words which fail are pure in God's sight. And He intercedes for me. I never knew what it was. Now I do. I never knew who Jesus was. Now I do. You know why? Because He changes everything. He changes everything and He wants to. Amen? Look at this. This is the last one. Second last one. Sorry. Second last one. Amen? Jesus showed up at Lazarus' grave. When did Jesus show up? Three days late and He was already stinking. I don't know about you. When God showed up in my life, it felt like three days late and I was stinking. I was not pretty. 
But Jesus stood at the grave of my life. At that disaster. I was already bound in the death clothes of sin. I was already bound up in everything the devil bound me with. He bound me like grave clothes and left me to die. And Jesus stood at that grave and said, Joshua, come out. And I stood up out the dead. Still bound. And I came to him. And what did Jesus say? Loose him, let him go. I came to Jesus. My life was in the grave already. I was dead in trespasses and sins. But Jesus stood at that dead situation of my life and said, Come out. Loose him, let him go. And I was loose, delivered and set free. I remember sitting in the church shaking like this because of all the devils that were in me. I'm telling you now, I, was, I, had, I had devils in me. Devils of pornography, devils of, of, of drug addiction, devils of alcohol, devils of anger. One of the first prayer meetings I came to, I sat there shaking in the prayer meeting praying. Everything on the inside of me saying, get out, get out. But my soul saying, I've got to find Jesus, I've got to find Jesus. Until the night I went to that church. Still shaking, I went forward for prayer. And the pastor told me everything I'd just spoken to God about in the bath. Laid his hands on me and then God loosed me in an instant. I could never go to church and do this. This was impossible for me. I couldn't do this. But then I met Jesus. He loosed me, spirit, soul and body. Now I lift my hands to him to give him glory and honor and praise. When I feel it, I dance. (laughs) I say hallelujah, I sing out loud. I couldn't do it before, now I can. Because he changed everything. He loosed me, he delivered me, he set me free. Amen. I don't care how dead your finances. I don't care how dead the situation. I don't care how dead the relationships. I don't care how dead maybe the doctor has proclaimed a certain aspect in your life because of sickness. When Jesus stands at your life, like he said to Lazarus, come forth. Jesus can bring anything back to life. Amen. Who's the Jesus that I serve? He's the one that knit me together in my mother's womb. You guys know certain things I like to say. That's one of the things I like to say. Because it's the truth. He created me in my mother's womb. He called me by my name. He chose me before the foundations of the earth. Before the earth was created, He knew me in Himself and knew that I would be His and He would be mine. Amen? All I had to do was submit. Amen? What is that song we just sang? He met me. He met me when I was so far away. He led me. He led me along that narrow way. Amen? He took me to the fountain. What fountain? The fountain that was opened wide on Calvary's tree. When they opened up his veins, when they pierced his hands and feet. When they opened up the veins of his back, when they laid the cat of nine tails upon him. When they put the thorn of, crown of thorns upon his head. When they lifted him up between heaven and earth. You know what fountain I'm talking about? I'm talking about the fountain that was opened when they shoved the spear in his side and out came blood and water. From Calvary flows a fountain of healing. A fountain of deliverance. A fountain of forgiveness. He found me, he took me, and he baptized me in the fountain of his blood. And I have no more sin. Amen. I make mistakes, I ask for forgiveness, and I have no more sin. Amen. He found me when I was so far away. He took a dead situation, and by his death gave me life. Because through his death, I now have his risen life. Amen. We sang it this morning as well. Last one. From this moment... Till the moment your heart beats its last. Until the moment you have your last breath. God will have compassion upon you. You have a chance. You have a chance to turn to Him and serve Him. You hear it in the Old Testament. It comes through the mouth of the prophets over and over and over. Say to Israel, if you will turn again to me, I will accept you as a father again. If you will but turn, if you will but turn The door of grace is open. Jesus has stepped forward. And he says, I'm here. To anyone who will believe. If you will come to me. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But have everlasting life. So Jesus says, open door. Whoever will come, I will not turn you away. Amen. And when I see this, you know what I think about? I think about the second thief on the cross. The one thief mocks. But the second thief does something very important. He says, have you no shame? Have you no fear of God? But listen to his words. First he confesses, we are guilty. I'm guilty. He is innocent. He's done nothing. We deserve to be here. He's confessed in front of Jesus. Lord, I'm guilty. You're not. 
You didn't do anything to put me on this cross. I did everything to put myself here. I lived my life the way I wanted to. And because of it, I'm now crucified and dying. But you're innocent. He says, I'm guilty. Then he says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Lord, I'm guilty. Please just think of me. Please just help me. I want to say something. It's not a religious formula. It's not how long you pray and how deep you pray and how much scripture you can quote. You know what it is? An honest confession out of your heart. An honest looking to Jesus because that's what the thief did. And an honest accept, accepting. An honest, an honest uh, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of the word now. Confession that Jesus is Lord. What did he say? Your kingdom. Think of me when you get into your kingdom. I'm guilty. I'm looking to you. You Lord. You innocent. Lord I want to come to your kingdom. It's not about a religious way of speaking. It's about honesty. If you can go down on the side of your bed and say, Lord, I'm guilty. You are Lord. My life is such a mess. All I want to do is look to you. I'm looking to you, Lord. I want to be part of your kingdom. That's all it takes. And not in my words, in your words. And not from here, not from here, but from here. Say, Lord, I want you. Because as your pastor said, when Jesus comes in, everything changes. I want to say one last thing about this. None of us are promised a 12th hour repentance. None of us are promised by God an 11th hour, 12th hour. Is that how they say it? A 12th hour? A last minute repentance. 11th hour. None of us are promised that. That happens with some people. That a pastor happens to come to the hospital while a man's on his deathbed. And the Holy Spirit drives that pastor into the room and he talks to the man and the man confesses and comes to Christ just before he dies. It does happen. It does but it's not promised any of us. Amen? It's not promised any of us that we will get a chance to say sorry before we go. Sometimes some of us are driving down the road and you enter into heaven. Boom. Gone. There was no time to say sorry. You know what? I want to live my life for Christ now. I want to live the way He wants me to live. Because I know what He did for me. I know where He took me from. I know who He changed me from to. He took me out of darkness and into light. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man in Christ Jesus. I don't want to go back. I want to stay with Him. And I want to live for the Oogwink. Because in the Oogwink, your life can be over. And in the Oogwink, Jesus can come back on the clouds of glory. And then the door of grace is closed. Amen? I don't want to go too much further. But Jesus changes everything. Amen? Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. You know, this morning, you and I should be thankful. Thank you, Lord. You didn't give me over. You didn't give me over to being mugged and beaten up and destroyed and cast in jail and overdosed and arrested. Or in a mental institute. Lord, you didn't give me over to that. I thank you for it. Lord, my soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowler. The devil tried to kill me. I, I, can't, I can't put it any other way. He tried to kill me. Amen. The snare is broken and we have escaped. He loosed me, delivered me. My chains are gone. What's that song says? My chains are gone. I've been loosed. My help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Who's the Lord that we serve? I quoted it last week and I just want to read it. It's one of my favorite scriptures as well. I just want to read it. This is the Lord that you and I serve. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance his appearance was like the sun that shines in its strength and when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead but he laid his right hand on me saying do not be afraid for I am the first and the last I am the alpha and the omega I am the one that was dead and is alive forevermore that's the Lord that we serve amen it is impossible for any person to get in contact with him and stay the same when you've come to contact with Jesus, you cannot stay the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. Coming to contact with Jesus is like a road that splits in two paths. Once you've come in contact with Him, the choices you make, either He will change you forever or you will go away the worse. You will go away the worse. 
The Bible says it's better for them that they had never known about salvation to begin with because their last state is worse than the first, having pushed away that which was given them. Amen? Come to Jesus. He will change everything. You know what the greatest thing? I thank God for saving my soul and forgiving my sins. But above everything, I thank God for what He's doing on the inside of me. For changing me. My attitudes, my holdings, my aggressiveness at times. I thank God that I can... I laid it at His feet and the Lord, Lord, Lord's taken it out of me. The ugly things. I thank God that He took those out as well. Some of them were a struggle, some of them He took out straight away. But I thank God that I can see now. I can see it and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being arrogant. I can see it. I'm becoming more like Jesus every day. And the more I become like Him and the more I know Him, the more I thank Him for it. It's a strange thing. The more I see it, the more it humbles me. And, and, and the more I become like Him, the less there's pride about it. Because, oh to grace, our greater debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. For had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for an old rugged cross, had it not been for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then forever this soul would be lost. But there was a day that Jesus changed everything. And he keeps changing it. Amen. Please stand with me. I'll ask our musicians to please come forward. Amen. And as we close, I just want to mention two things. One, this is for those that feel the Holy Spirit is saying, listen, you must choose. Are you going to serve God or not? Because the choice is left at your door. Choose this day who you will serve. Because as a pastor, I place it before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. And I encourage you in Jesus Christ, choose life. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. Amen. You have that choice. But also, as us who do love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and have given ourselves over to Him, and have been born again from above, and are filled with the Holy Spirit, and are walking on the narrow way, it's a daily choice, eh? It's a daily choice. The Bible says, be careful you who think you stand lest you fall. It's a daily choice. I must daily say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. Lord, change everything. Lord, I'm coming to you in traffic when I lose my temper. Lord, change everything. Keep coming to God. Keep letting the Lord Jesus change you. Change you, change you. Because from this place to eternity, I think we will leave into heaven still with our arms stretched out. Saying, Lord, give me more of you. Lord, make me more like you. Lord, change me into your image daily. Amen. Let's pray together. Right there we are. Please bow your heads. Close your eyes with me. Pray with me in your heart. There we are. Heavenly Father, into your presence we come in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for us. My Lord Jesus, I can preach this this morning because it's not doctrine I'm preaching, but it's, it's something I've lived. Lord, it is doctrine and it is sound doctrine, but it's also something I've lived. I know what you do in the life of a person when they come to you. I know that you loose, that you deliver, that you set free, that you save. I know that you love with a measure that's far beyond what we can understand. I know that your grace and mercy fails not. I know, Lord, that, that we can say, if it had not been for the Lord, we would have been handed over to those that hate us. If it had not been for the Lord, then they would have chewed us up and spat us out. But the Lord has broken the snare of the fowler. He's broken it and loosed us. We've escaped like a bird from the net. And we want to thank you for that. Lord, help us to keep coming to you, Jesus, for everything. To keep coming to you that you can change us, Lord. Lord, we lay our lives at your feet this morning. And Lord, we come to you and we say, Lord, everything I am, I'm giving it to you, Lord. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have thy own way in me. And we thank you for it, Lord. And we give you all the praise, the glory, the honor and the thanksgiving. Lord, I want to lift up anybody in this church to you at this moment who felt that this word spoke to them. I want to lift them up to you at this moment and I ask you to see them, Lord. Lord, I know that your Holy Spirit has spoken to hearts this morning in this church, Lord. And Lord, I ask you to be the one that takes the word that's planted, Lord. Let it be watered. And Lord, that you would bring the increase. That Lord, people would this morning say, you know, I'm going to make the choice now. I'm not going to put it off any longer. But Lord, I give you my life. I give you my all. Have your, have your own way in me, Lord. And that, Lord, if they would do that, I know the blessing that comes from it. I know that a life given to you and surrendered to you is the best life that can be lived. And, Lord Jesus, I thank you for it.